Well, welcome back and welcome to our virtual audience as well. Uh, I'm delighted to have this uh, second panel here. We're going to hear from the labor side and the labor economics. Laura Ritchie has uh, worked in the in women's issue and, and union issues for a few years. <laughs> and, and, and I am so delighted and I want to thank her very much for coming, uh, Terry and Friday Bruno, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Ottawa, who is going to talk a little about uh, a black feminist approach, I think, to, uh, to the issue, uh, decentering the narrative on accessible childcare. Uh, and then I my hope is that we can continue to have some more questions and, and respond. And because we may have a little bit of time, we can also um, engage a little bit more about the next steps and, and what are the things that uh, Massey College and that uh, generally the women here could do. So uh, Laura, why don't we start with you? Thank you so much to, uh, to Massey College and uh, the organizers uh, of this discussion. It's uh, a very, very important one. Um, I'm going to say a few words about a, a workforce strategy. Some of it's already been said uh, earlier, so it'll be a matter of emphasis. Um, I'll try to add a few uh, additional points. Um, I, I will say that um, I am not an expert as such on childcare, but it has been uh, a lifelong um, passion. And uh, so in some sense, I'm less about what you need to look at for, mo for modeling uh, expertise and maybe more what we can do as uh, uh, every woman or every person um, to uh, try to move this agenda forward. Um, this is also a bit of an old home week <laughs> in a way because uh, the, here at um, uh, Massey College we're, uh, we could say the epicenter, certainly we're halfway between the, um, what was the old uh, campus uh, daycare center on Devonshire. Uh, um, uh, what is now, of course, the big uh, Goldring Center. And um, the, on the other side of the road here, uh, Simcoe Hall, uh, which is where uh, hundreds of us gathered in 1970 to support an occupation at the uh, U of T Senate chambers. And uh, this was when um, the center had been given basically eviction notice. And we were trying to keep a, uh, a nonprofit and cooperative center uh, in, in, in play. Um, we did eventually win that one. I say we, uh, not as, as a central uh, uh, person to that, but as a supporter uh, in the public and, um, of course, as a feminist. And if you ever want to read about this, uh, Julie Mathian has written an excellent piece uh, called Struggles and Sit-Ins, and you can find it on childcarecanada.org, their website. Um, it's a fascinating history and an important one. So I, I hate to say it, but that's half a century ago. Um, also roughly a century ago, um, we, as uh, other of the long-term activists on this have noted, uh, we're, we're pretty active uh, on, on a number of fronts. Uh, I know people like uh, Lorna Marsden and, and Kathleen Morrison, uh, who's also with us today, uh, were part of uh, writing into the provincial Ontario government in 1904 and many meetings and briefs thereafter. Um, and this uh, was to address uh, what the then government, uh, conservative government, thought they could do to address the uh, emergent issue of women in the labor force needing childcare. Uh, and that was, um, in fact, to, well, uh, change the standards so that you could look after more kids. Uh, each childcare worker could look after more kids. Uh, that's a, a solution. Um, it's one solution. Uh, and also there was a tremendous emphasis on parents uh, uh, volunteering at, at centers. Um, and in some respects, this was revisited in the 90s with the Harris government, uh, 
at least the original iterations of the uh, child parenting uh, centers. So, um, I, I, so having having said that, my my uh, my expertise is, expertise has been more around labor issues and active on issues like uh, uh, employment insurance, parental leave, and those kinds of issues. Um, I've continued to uh, this and with some colleagues in a group we call the uh, care economy uh, team. We have continued um, to be working on issues of the care economy, uh, education, child care, long-term care, health care. Um, so uh, just this week, um, maybe some of you saw the same thing, um, although most of you would have seen it online and it's a different graphic. A uh, great graphic. Um, uh, this was the, uh, oh, I guess I have to pay attention to <laughs> the streaming that's going on. Um, anyway, uh, it, I, I was reading a really wonderful International Women's Day column by Armenia Alnesian in the Toronto Star. And there was humor and other things in it, but it also was recounting uh, <coughs> uh, the reason why things are not all so rosy for women still. Um, then I checked the reader's comments, sometimes a mistake. Um, first up was a guy arguing that women earn less because men do the difficult, dangerous, and dirty work. Not my words, his. Huh. So, uh, what century? Um, was he referring to, I, by the way, I added my own comment, this won't surprise you. Uh, was he maybe referring to all the women who were changing diapers in infant care centers or keeping peace between kids in a child care center or kindergarten or trying to bathe an agitated Alzheimer's patient or resident in a long-term care home or risking uh, their health during COVID, uh, going to these same workplaces day after day, often by public transit. Uh, no, I don't think he was, because those are mostly women, and in big cities like Toronto, that means mostly racialized women. As of the last published census, 96%, uh, 96% of early childhood educators and paid home care providers were women. I think if there's one thing that COVID uh, should have taught us, is that we often value and esteem and reward all the wrong things in the labor market. We have it quite upside down. It is not the Bay Street stockbroker earning six or seven figures who contributes to important labor to our society day in and day out. And so this is one reason, uh, bearing this in mind, that our care economy team quickly put together an update uh, of our fact sheet on uh, child care and early learning to mark International Women's Day. And you have a copy with it with you uh, now. Um, and if you go to the website that's at the bottom, uh, thecareeconomy.ca, uh, and you can follow the links there to the supporting data. Uh, go to the PDF um, version and you'll see that you can hot link there to the supporting data. So some of the data or the facts. Uh, Canada's ECE workforce is large, over 300,000, more than 1% of the working population. And that's in a variety of sectors, uh, including, of course, licensed childcare, but in other kinds of services uh, where there are people working as ECEs. One third of that workforce are immigrants or non-permanent residents, uh, which is larger than the proportion uh, in, their, in other occupations where it's roughly a quarter. And among ECEs and their assistants, 5% are Indigenous. And again, that is a bit more than the 4% in their overall workforce numbers. These workers, half of them were paid less in this study of, than $20 an hour. And even assuming full year work of 40 hours uh, uh, schedules, and one cannot always assume that, but even assuming that, that's, that's $40,000 a year for doing critical work. 
only in Alberta, that may surprise you, but uh, it is a wealthy province, and in Quebec, that won't surprise you. Uh, can you do this work without risking poverty? Uh, and that uh, the charting uh, of those uh, earnings is again available on the website I mentioned. The Ontario Ministry data on full care workers in licensed care facilities shows a significant share of child care workers were making less than $17.50 an hour just last year in 2022. That's actually shocking. Uh, Ontario's minimum wage uh, now is $15.50. One third of Canada's licensed child care workers have no health benefits, not to speak of pensions, uh, where only 17% have RSPs or private pensions through their workplace. 41%, almost half, have no paid personal leave days. While most of the federal agreements specify the need to improve pay, and many other provinces have significantly improved wages, Ontario has only committed to a new floor that is currently $19 an hour. That means that a certified, in other words, they've taken their trade certification, a certified ECE can be paid the same or less than a pet groomer. And if you doubt that, then just go on a, a gig website like indeed.com and you'll find that out quickly enough. The agreements also spoke about the need to recruit and retain qual qualified workers. And uh, like others, I want to emphasize uh, the retention aspect. Too many are leaving the sector, often after considerable uh, training commitments. And it is no wonder when you understand what the working conditions and remuneration is in the sector. And on average, uh, people are leaving these positions after roughly three years. Uh, it, it is a terrible waste of their time, their commitment, their energy, and for that matter, what the public has put into their uh, training and supporting them through that process. Among the ECEs in Ontario who resigned their position, the majority took employment outside of licensed childcare. So we need a serious workforce action plan. We need a strategy. Um, and we need it um, beyond, I would argue, uh, a particular municipality or even a particular province. We need to have this happening across the country and we, we need to be sharing uh, the learnings and the data, and that goes together with the federal commitment that, that is not currently that is needed to help make that happen. Or these jobs are going to continue to be treated as a way station, not a career, and no different than waitering in a restaurant is for many people while, while you're on your way to other things. And if we're not careful and uh, paying attention and vigilant, uh, we're going to be in the same boat uh, as Nova Scotia and probably already are, which just this week announced they'd failed to meet their target under these agreements of 1,500 new daycare spots by the end of uh, 2022. So a couple of months ago, that's where they were supposed to be at. But instead, they only had 400 uh, new licensed childcare spaces. The government there says that they will make up the difference by the end of the year. They blame ch supply chains and labor pressure, was their word, for the uh, delay. Uh, yes, labor pressures. Uh, I'd say that is code uh, for all the mounting problems. Um, they've been there for a long time, but they're mounting uh, of around recruit recruitment and retention. So. Um, a workforce force action plan requires planning. Uh, we've often gotten used to big promises from governments uh, with some money for a special for a specific issue, um, but with minimal plans and strategies for implementation. Um, it's one reason that uh, our care economy team held a, uh, a, a, a forum uh, during the pandemic to discuss how do we have an effective labor force strategy.
And the thing is that, is that me? <laughs> Okay, good. Sorry, I meant to turn it back off. Absolutely. Either that or the duck cleaners. <laughs> um, so the, the, the thing is that this question is still with us because um, there has been and continues to be inadequate planning to make working conditions that are all reasonable uh, and that do not depend on exploiting a largely female, largely uh, racialized workforce. And the failure to uh, really anticipate needs that are arising with uh, an aging workforce, meaning that there are fewer people of a certain age uh, in the paid uh, workforce. Uh, and uh, the pandemic, I'm going to stress again, uh, certainly uh, magnified these chronic issues, but the point is they are chronic and we need to get down to work. So I'm just going to end with a, a, a few of the key messages uh, for them. Uh, first and foremost, as, as uh, um, healthcare uh, researchers uh, Pat and Hugh Armstrong have said about long-term care and healthcare uh, really for decades, the conditions of work are the conditions of care, and that cannot be emphasized enough. And care workers can only utilize their skill effectively and deliver quality care if they have appropriate conditions. And they can only stay in their jobs if their conditions allow them to lead healthy and secure lives, never mind thinking about retirement one day. Uh, and we all pay the price uh, when that is not happening. And there is an OECD study that some of those conditions, at least in, in a broad way, um, uh, what is it that not only attracts people, but keeps people in these jobs. The second point that uh, people uh, made and discussed was that the focus has to be more on the most vulnerable, uh, rebuilding these jobs from the bottom up. Uh, and amongst other things, uh, that requires a floor of minimum enforced standards uh, for work and for care. Some of those could and should be part of uh, agreements, um, but also of provincial uh, and in some cases federal uh, and certainly territorial uh, legislation. Um, they need to be enforceable uh, and uh, uh, they need to come with some meaning penalties when they are not uh, followed. Uh, rather than just hoping that somehow this is all going to trickle down. We all engage in a kind of magical thinking, which I think others have been talking about, like the government makes an announcement at different levels and, uh, you know, there you are. You've got the, the system that you wanted. Um, not so. And you can tell your friends that. <laughs> um, so uh, for workers in this sector, and this, these will be some of the lowest paid and most vulnerable. That's going to mean new entitlements to things like uh, paid sick days and more rights to predictable and reasonable uh, schedules. Thirdly, uh, more funding and supports for serious improvements in pay. People have already talked about the problems that we have uh, with that, uh, uh, certainly in this province of Ontario. Um, but we need to expand the discussion. Uh, equal pay for work of equal value is always equal pay. Uh, it was always equal remuneration, actually, uh, under the uh, International Labor Organization standard. So we need to expand that discussion so that we're also talking about benefits in the workplace and pensions. And as others have met, um, supports uh, for unionizations where that's the path the workers have chosen. Um, but we also know that the pay more and they will come uh, strategy, uh, well, a necessary condition is, is not the whole story uh, to deal with labor shortages. And uh, right now, the job vacancy rate uh, for EC ECEs and, and assistants uh, is the largest labor shortage uh, in the country after nurses, retail store workers, and truck drivers. 
Fourthly, the training, and again, others are able to talk about this in more detail, but training has to be accessible, it has to be appropriate, and it has to provide for continuing uh, education for all those uh, who work on, on care, in care. And this is an Ontario study that found that 30% of positions in licensed childcare requiring an ECE credential were staffed by staff, were filled by, with staff without uh, those necessary qualifications. We have some road to go. Um, uh, number five, uh, we also need to address the precarity employment and in migration status. I mentioned earlier uh, uh, one third, um, including people without official uh, formal resident status. We need to have access and support uh, for workers in this sector, as in others, to facilitate pathways to permanent status. Otherwise, um, as one consequence, we're going to end up relying on the temporary exploited, exploitative um, a temporary foreign worker program to deal with the shortages. Do not think that this is only an issue on the farms uh, in, in this country. It's starting to pop up in healthcare and other sectors. Uh, number six, uh, and here others have said it so much uh, more eloquently, but we need to ensure that the public funding is going to uh, public and nonprofit uh, services and not the uh, for-profit big box uh, uh, chains. Uh, in fact, our, our uh, uh, care economy team has started referring to this as uh, not privatization but profitization uh, as, as the biggest threat. Um, and we do need to be making deliberate planning. We need deliberate for a, a publicly managed system. Um, I mean, just uh, Im imagine if we had to access uh, public school or even kindergarten for our kids uh, as we now uh, have to go through to access childcare. And uh, I know there is a debate about entrepreneurs and we've had some discussion, um, but it is also a fact that all these private equity firms that are coming into play <coughs> are offering private entrepreneurs um, offers they can't refuse. Uh, and uh, that is, is, again, going to be something that um, we come into, run into more and more. And finally, uh, number seven, uh, this was um, uh, framed, and I think there's probably a better way that it might be for now, uh, but we, at the time, talked about establishing a pan-Canadian body uh, for childcare human resources. Uh, and uh, obviously that could be expanded into, into uh, other policy areas, but we need public reporting on the progress that's being made uh, in equity, uh, uh, in, in best quality care, and quality work. Um, we need to identify the scale of the labor shortages in, in a lot more detail than we have right now and to monitor the, pro monitor the progress in reducing those labor shortages uh, and sharing that information and those learnings. Um, we need to get serious about a workforce strategy in childcare and in other carers. Um, altogether, the care economy uh, sectors account for <clears throat> over 12% of the GDP of this country and over 20% of all the jobs, and that's as of uh, the end of last year. So um, that's my thoughts. for this map and, and looking at all the issues that are raised in, in, in this context. So I'm delighted to invite uh, Terrin to address us. Uh, welcome, for, uh, welcome to Toronto. Uh, so happy that you were able to come to Massey College and to, uh, from, from Ottawa. Thank you. So, good morning. <laughs> My name is Tureen Friday-Bruno, and uh, 
Apologies if my breath sounds really heavy or if I smack while I speak. Um, I'm more of a writer, so I'm more comfortable. So please forgive me in advance. Um, <clears throat> my talk of, the topic of my discussion this morning is decentering the narrative on accessible child care. It is in part academic and in part a reflection, so I'll call it an academic reflection. And it is, I would even say it's a, it's a discourse analysis, a critical discourse analysis. I want to thank the host for this invitation to be here, and uh, also to my supervisor, Professor Backhouse. Uh, it's a true joy working with you. I'm humbled to work with you. It's a lot of fun. Though I must admit, I was shocked to see that I was identified as an expert on childcare. Um, perhaps one could call me an expert because right now I am a user of <laughs> childcare. <laughs> and, uh, and also I did decide to, uh, well, as I tried to navigate the Ontario childcare system, I decided to opt out altogether and move to Quebec, where I currently enjoy full day childcare for my toddler with excellent educators um, at a whopping cost of $200 a month. Even though I have uh, another one on the way right now, I'm still able to head squarely on my pillow and sleep at night because I know it will still cost far less than daycare fees for even one child in most parts of Canada and most parts of Ontario. So let me tell you a little bit about what childcare looked like for me growing up. I grew up in a two-parent household with both parents working in and around the Ottawa Gatineau area. Since my father worked shifts, it was there for my parents to jostle childcare responsibilities, supplemented with the occasional babysitter. When I was three or four, my parents found a place for me in a home daycare at the other end of our street in our mostly white neighborhood. What my parents did not know, and what I did not have the words to communicate at that time, and was too afraid to point to was the fact that my home daycare provider was. I remember the interactions I'd had with her, her daughter, and some of the other children in her care. And that it was somehow different for me and the little Nigerian boy in her care who also lived down the street from the only other black family in the neighborhood. All I knew was that we were treated differently and that still I was treated differently than the Nigerian boy because something about me was better. But who could expect a four-year-old to understand that the difference between my little friend and me was wrapped up in big concepts like colorism and transnational migration? All I know is that today, that little Nigerian boy is now a big Nigerian doctor saving Canadian lives. And yet, what a horrific and hurtful start. I wonder if he remembers the way I do. I remember thinking years later that if slash when I had children, I would always opt for public regulated daycare because I wanted that choice. And I do not want my children in anybody's home daycare. Before you assume I'm a bleeding heart liberal who wants to spend your hard earned tax dollars, <laughs> let me assure you that very little about me can be objectively characterized as such. For example, I've ever campaigned for a liberal or even an NDP candidate for that matter. I am pro-choice, however, I am vocal about my own belief that I prefer we choose life, recognizing that it's a normative statement and also recognizing the intersecting issues of white nationalism and anti-abortion rhetoric, but I'll digress. Continuing on, I believe that strong marriages and unions with strong values are foundational to a functional society. I like to wear pearls. And I'm a licensed minister in my church organization. That's right, my name is actually the Reverend Tareen Friday Bruno. <laughs> what I'm trying to get at here is that we can't make assumptions about where people stand on the topic of child care as it is beyond a solely political issue. In fact, I would argue it is more, more so a social issue with, dare I say it, intersecting gender, class, and race distinctions and I do want to point out that, as Laura has, has already mentioned, um, just what most of the, uh, the workers that are underpaid and in inner cities look like. This is where my perspective has particular value. Black feminist womanist, which to me does not mean 
emancipation from all non-women or radical independence, but rather to me, it means choice. It means choosing to be the heart of the community where social connections are formed and developed over time, along with other choices that were not afforded to my ancestors. My perspective is therefore culturally based and is not divorced from nor subordinated to my position as woman. I must advise though that I do not claim to be the ideal representation of a monolithic black woman, which also does not exist. I am, for one, a doctoral student at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Law. I have a mortgage in a decent neighborhood. I have generous parental leave benefits from my employer. And I have a partner who also goes to the same law school as me. In other words, I am enormously privileged and do not submit myself to be a fair representation of the opportunities or circumstances we are typically afforded. In fact, these conversations in themselves, in the middle of a workday in downtown Toronto, is privileged. And I ask that we remember the women who could not be here, and when we talk about reconfiguring childcare, inclusive beyond white suburbia. So I want to highlight that my thoughts, opinions, and expressions are based on my experiences and those of the women around me. And what does black feminist womanist culture say about childcare? First, it says that black women have been rearing their babies without help or state intervention from time immemorial, or what uh, Patricia Hans calls communal care. Um, and this was in her, uh, it was a seminal work of hers called What's in a Name? Womanism, Black Feminism and Beyond. I'm actually in the middle of writing my comps right now, due next Wednesday. So I'm very much in the middle of uh, having all these uh, conversations with myself in my head. So communal care says that almost every black mother, auntie, or other female relative of mine or of my other sister friends who has had a, t a child typically worked before, during, and after pregnancy, and usually did not have the social or economic capital to comp contemplate being a stay-at-home mom. The phenomenon of these black baby-rearing mamas is what I'll call true feminine mystique. Ah, somebody got it. <laughs> the very notion of accessible childcare was not always a reality for them, which flips the narrative on choice. I here contemplate the black feminist womanist position because whenever the childcare debate is brought to the foreground, I often wonder whose children are we really talking about and why? This question reminds me of the first time I made into the childcare conversation without knowing how socially charged it was. Several years ago, I was an intern at a conservative think tank where I was tasked with writing an article about childcare, more specifically, the deficits, drawbacks, and detriments of publicly funded childcare. <laughs> As a former journalist and avid writer, I thought, piece of cake. <laughs> what a disaster. I poured over articles, commentaries, studies, and testimonies on publicly funded childcare in Sweden, Norway, and Quebec, to name a few locales, and contrasted them with the US and the rest of Canada. I was dumbfounded. Play-based learning until six or seven years old? <coughs> Social integration? More balanced labor, labor market participation? And healthier, happier children and parents? Not that the childcare regimes in these places are perfect, but it's a start. I veered off task and started scouring the internet on childcare in the American and Canadian inner cities and also started to look at stats on race. The proof was there. Children who otherwise stand less of a chance could at least get a good start during their most critical years. With my assignment hanging over my head, I fumbled around for weeks, months, trying to get something off the ground, and in the end, threw in the towel, allowing myself to look like an utter failure. I didn't know at the time what exactly made me feel so uncomfortable, but I know it had to do with this question. Whose children are we really talking about? There are constant critiques of the mere possibility of publicly funded daycare, pitches for a, fed uh, a federal tax credit that would allow for greater choice for everyone. I found it odd that the Canadian government, who was desperate for more Canadian, Canadian babies and probably still is, would create a proposed policy that did little to ensure accessibility and timely childcare 
and did not give early childhood education the focus and attention that it deserved. On the other hand, it's worth saying that not everybody trusts the system or wants to have anything to do with it. Some of my fellow black moms are opting out of the state model altogether and are coming up with alternative learning strategies for their little ones, including homeschooling communities or learning partnerships where a pool of parents directly fund one or two educators who they've vetted and trust. And yet, I'm convinced these alternatives were birthed from a sense of them that remains. Whose children are we, meaning the state and general society, so concerned about investing in? Um, I'm here going to pull a quote from uh, an article that I uh, read uh, from Martha McCluskey, and it is generally based on uh, U.S. law, but I think it also applies to um, uh, to Canada as well. In the when I read it, you'll see why. Um, but it's a reader that was edited by uh, Martha Feynman called Transcending the Boundaries of Law. And it says, in the US, and I think it applies to Canada as well in the discourse, economic equality has long been feminized and racialized. For example, political commentators and policy analysts use the term nanny state to code progressive economics as an affront to a moral order dependent on upper class, white male over women, children, and servants, especially female servants of color. And I think we all know uh, what nannies in the U.S. are more likely to look like historically. So it's, it's a trope. What I'm suggesting here is that the discourse on accessible childcare is, is largely white, liberal, and classed. Even though we should absolutely be wary of falling into the trap of, of assuming feminist policies are any more redistributive than some conservative-backed policies. Whose children are we really talking about? Fast forward five years later. I married my best friend. Since we were able to ramp up our savings during COVID lockdowns, we were ready to buy a house a little sooner than expected. We put all of our criteria on the table, one of them being accessible childcare. When we did the math, it was a no-brainer. We would move to Quebec. I do want to point out that um, opportunity we had to do so because we already lived in the Ottawa Gatineau area, whereas a lot of other people don't actually have uh, that, <laughs> that option to them. My future children would not only be bilingual, but would also receive quality subsidized care from a regulated profession. Further, it allowed me to choose the best choice for our family, a home where mommy has her own career and feels fulfilled. This is not to or chide anyone who chooses to raise their children within the home on a full-time basis or find alternative means to do so. Congratulations, you've made the best choice for you. And I ask that you also congratulate me for making the best decision for our family and grabbing hold of the opportunity that I was afforded. In closing, please know that these thoughts and reflections are not a full picture as the canvas is still always continue to be painted. I also want to assure you, I do not pretend to misunderstand the socio-political agenda in Quebec of early assimilation and a learned pedagogy under the banner of state nationalism. I have a myriad, <laughs> I have myriad stories about growing up in Quebec and my experiences that let me know just how welcome and recognized as a Quebec I was. But that's a story for another day. But in the end, I will take it. I can handle a little bit of white nationalism as long as I have the freedom to teach my children their own history and belonging, or at the very least, take a few educational trips with the money I'll be saving in childcare fees every year. <laughs> At the end of the day, the choice is mine. Thank you. Oh, thank you both. This was so wonderful. Thank you very much for, for being here and for sharing this story. Time for a question. Uh, um, if there Can I is a, just yes. ask, uh, that if we're going to have a discussion on the workforce, um, I see other people here, a couple of the speakers who were here earlier, who are more expert in maybe Carolyn Ferns from the Ontario mm -hmm. Coalition. Is sure. that possible? Sure. Yeah, sure. Like a, yes, we yeah. can just bring no, a chair. Sure. Yeah, okay. Any questions? Uh, uh, well, if uh, let me let me start. Uh, uh, 
I think let, let me start with the 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 question. The, I think you you both had the economics uh, in it. You know the the cost of of childcare for the family. Uh, you know making decisions based on that as being a, a criteria for where where to live. Um, and you mentioned something that well, I'm I'm convinced that it's good childcare that my child is receiving good childcare. And I was wondering. From, from your perspective, what gives you that feeling that it's good childcare? You know, as a user, what are the criteria lo you were looking for? Um, so one, I, I, first I want to start by saying it's definitely not perfect. There's room for improvement. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's funny because when Laurel had mentioned uh, about the turnover, I think you said everything yeah. is. Yeah. Um, my child's um, lead educator, who mm -hmm. is abs well, absolutely amazing, um, just left after three and a half years. <laughs> and she was fantastic, and I know it's likely burnout. Um, so for me, I think part of it is seeing the joy in the educators. Mm -hmm. They love what they do. Um, I know it comes with some remuneration, mm -hmm. though I don't think that's what they're motivated by. Mm -hmm. um, they do a lot of hard work. Um, you know, I can I can see it when I when I uh, when I go to meet my child when I drop up in the morning or if I come happen to come midday. Uh, just the types of activities. I think it's also the uh, the, the, the the focus and attention they give the children. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is. I was trying to find a word that's less uh, harsh than shameful, um, but I don't know if I can. Uh, that we give so little mm -hmm. uh, focus and attention to mm -hmm. uh, the care of our most vulnerable in society. Yeah, pa you know, Pat Armstrong that says, you know, the quality of work is the quality of care, and I think we, we see that in the, what about, the, you know, you, uh, obviously, you joined the conversation, so uh, let, let us uh, hear a little bit your perspective I on guess, this. Uh, just to reiterate, I, yeah, I completely agree with you. And we're talking about this issue of retention. One of the facts on, on your sheet, Laurel, was about, um, you know, that childcare is one of the places with the biggest job gaps other than, like, retail and uh, nursing and yeah. trucking, yeah. truck retail driver. and trucking. But the difference between retail and trucking and childcare is that for the young child, when we talk about quality, yes. quality for the young child is whether or not they are able to make a connection mm -hmm. and build a relationship with an early child educator over yeah. their time in childcare. And so when we say recruitment and retention is an issue, what I really want to talk about is about the focus on the experience in the life of a child. If the person that I, an infant or mm -hmm. a toddler has built a relationship with, mm -hmm who is the, the person whose name they know. Mm -hmm. If that child goes to childcare on Monday and that person's gone because they couldn't make a living working in childcare, they've gone to work at the Costco, mm -hmm. what does that mean for that child's experience? It means that they may go through their early childhood education and care years and make uh, a Another significant connection. connection with the caregiver. And so it is, that's why for me, it is the most important issue that we get right um, because I think practically the system is not going to be built unless we deal with workforce, um, but also from a quality, because it is what it is what quality is, um, is, is the experience within child. Okay. Laurel, any uh, thoughts on, on the quality of care? How do we identify quality of care? You're the one that used uh, Pat Armstrong's uh, okay. uh, quote, famous quote. So any thoughts on... Uh, yes, so uh, let's start with uh, uh, Nathan and then I'll get to Laura. Yes, yeah. Uh, I found it very interesting that you used the language. <laughs> I found it very interesting that you used the language of choice. It's actually mm -hmm. language that can be incredibly powerful politically and is often used against sort of uh, an expansive publicly funded child care yep. system. And I quite like that you use it back to say, no, no, no. We need to have a choice. To, right? so, <laughs> so then, though, to confront the political challenge within choice, because mm -hmm. I work 
nine to five in the course of dropping my kid off in the morning and kids up from school. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is afforded that same opportunity in their, in, their, in, in their work. And so as we build out the system that we want to build mm -hmm. and we want to defend choice and, and, and use that language back, mm -hmm. how do we do so effectively and meet the moment not only for the labor force to say how do we bring a labor force in and we're able to work those different hours, but also accommodate childcare for people who work those different hours at the same time. Yeah, so I think the first step is um, making sure we have inclusive conversations. Um, so I, I mentioned in, in uh, you know, when I was speaking, I'm very mindful that a lot of people, um, maybe who would have liked to be here today, aren't Just here. Can't, yeah. can't, they, they can't be here. Child care, uh, whether for child care or work or a combination of both. Um, so I think that it starts from the ground. Um, I am. I am critical of, especially of conversations that start out without voices included, and then when you know there's traction. Oh, okay. Well, we need more visibility now. Okay, let's let's include these voices here and there to sort of support uh, you know the, the the bigger picture. Make sure we have buy-in, and I think that's problematic. I think that it takes rolling our sleeves up and um, engaging with those that uh, might not otherwise know these conversations are happening but would love to engage and have a lot to contribute to it uh, to be able to move that forward. Yeah. Well, so uh, Laurel and, uh, so there is a tension between good working conditions and offering a flexible childcare experience that would maybe go beyond the hours and have expended hours mm -hmm. um, I mean it's the same thing in other care mm -hmm. uh, facilities yeah. is that expressed by the workers or is that yeah. you know is that a, a concern and if that's the case yeah. how do we uh, you know yeah. come around to speaking about and giving respectful work uh, but that is at the same time flexible and responsive to, yeah. to the, the, the women. I think you see that in childcare right mm -hmm. now, that the, the most difficult positions to staff are before and after school childcare, mm -hmm. because those are often split shifts. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's, it's low pay, it's split shifts. And so it's it, increasingly you see child, actually school age childcare is the one age group that actually hasn't recovered from before. We have mm -hmm. fewer school age childcare spaces now than we did in 2019 in Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, yes, I think that's an issue, but it, it's, it's tied to the way the work is, <laughs> is yes. I mean, it, they don't have to be split shifts. There's mm -hmm. ways of structuring this mm -hmm. to make it decent work. It's mm -hmm. whether or not we put decent work at the core okay. of, uh, of this uh, mm -hmm. system as, as we build it um, that's going to be really important. And so I think that, you know, if we're talking about non-standard hours, childcare, and Martha, I'm <laughs> looking at Martha, a lot of work on, um, on how, how we could have uh, more flexible models of childcare. And they're not gonna just spring up out of the ground. Mm -hmm. um, they would need to be planned, and they're best planned as part of uh, this system, and making sure that the wages and working conditions for those uh, working in those programs oh. are, <laughs> are there. Yes, uh, Martha, to here, and then, uh, then I'll get to you, Laura. Okay. I have another question. Yeah, but I, I think there's some really important points here, so I think, Part of it is how the lang language is being used. I mean, yeah. so that's one thing yeah. I just want to put it. But I just want to talk about this issue of flexible. Mm -hmm. Because uh, um, there is a saw off. When you talk about childcare from the perspective of the child, mm -hmm. let alone the workforce, ultimate flexibility is a for children. I mean, in a way, it gets back to what sort of what you're talking about. You know, like about is how do they? What's their life like? And you know, like, do they have a, a you know a pattern of life? And I do think that people haven't really figured this out yet. Is that first of all, a lot of things can't be solved with childcare alone. Mm -hmm. And I would say, like, I'm part of this project that is looking at the intersections between parental leave, child care, work. Mm -hmm. And I do think that when you sort of talk about issues of, let's call it choice, in a, not just that neo extreme neoliberal sense, but in a yeah. real sense, it's not just child care, it's other parts of employment and people's lives you know, that you sort of have to think about. If you really look at 
uh, the issue of non-standard hours childcare. Mm -hmm. There's non-standard hours and there's non-standard hours. And like you know, to the thing about can you pro provide childcare for all shift workers in the middle of the night? And then the other question is, and should you? Should everybody be working? You mm -hmm. know, yeah, some so people have to work yeah. overnight, but ultimately everybody doesn't have to. And do we need to use? Uh, other policy areas also. So I just want to emphasize this, that these terms are kind of slung around mm -hmm. without actually, I think you're, uh, Tureen, I think so that some of the things that you reflected on really speak to some of these issues, I have to say. And I think that we need to do a lot more of that mm -hmm. rather than just say, oh, we need flexible childcare. Well, yes, we do, but then what, what in is what context? that? In <laughs> yeah, what context? Yes, that's, yeah. well, that was the question. Yeah. What is yeah. that and what, what are the implications yeah. that it would have for the other objectives, for sure? Uh, Lorna, yeah. you, you need to have the, the, the mic and then I will. Thank you. I, I wonder if you speak to some specialized questions which I have not heard, but then mm. there's a lot I haven't heard in the mm. child care debate. I'm thinking of um, child care for children whose parents are in prison. We know quite a lot about the prison population in this country. You know it's heavily indigenous in many parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And we know that they're because in my previous life as a senator, you get a lot of correspondence from women prisoners. Complicated lives. D does the care of their children come up in the planning, in the thinking about this yeah. at this stage? And, and if not, shouldn't it? So, I can see Martha is, is nodding. I think it's, it's not that it's never come up. Oh, Martha, take the mic. I know. I have known several people who are interested in this, and we're actually kind of pursuing it. You're talking about it. We are so far from having even mainstream, like sort of ordinary nine to five childcare. So that's what I'm saying is that it has come up, but there's lots of issues that you need to maybe figure out. You know, they need to be figured out in and of themselves. It's not. It's never come up. But well, first of all, is why do we have so many more so women many, in you know, prison? You know, like, yeah. There's lots and lots. Of, in and of itself, somebody could really study that. And I'm thinking 20 years ago, I knew a couple of people who were very interested in this. But it kind of vanishes because here's one as a rule of thumb, if I may say so. You need to have a stable balance or a stable platform of ch regular child care, which we don't have that is responsive at the local level and all that kind of and then there are these other issues that are much harder to do like very non-standard hours child care or special populations even remote communities like mm -hmm. if you think about i mean really i don't just mean rural i mean like real remote communities mm -hmm. like what does that look like you know so i would say the focus of the child care movement has mostly been let's get some basis on which to build these things including funding because you can't do those things without you can't do them as pilot projects all the time yeah. we're a nation of pilot projects <laughs> so <laughs> in, in, if that answers your question yes <laughs> thank you I have two questions and I'll keep them quick one is around general workforce strategy do you think there's any value in exploring a workforce strategy for all care workers and yeah. not just a child force mm -hmm. really thinking about like system building across different sectors, especially if it's similar type of work or they have similar type of issues. Um, and then, Turin, my question specifically for you was around, it was interesting hearing you talk about the criteria for child care that mattered to you. And was there any point where you thought, oh, nonprofit or publicly funded or for profit? Like, did that ever come up or do you feel it would have came up later? Because that's kind of the campaign conversations mm -hmm. we've been having, right? Well, uh, just on, on, on the question of, of uh, care work in general, um, I, uh, there, are, there are efforts now to have those kinds of larger conversations. And the forum I spoke about earlier uh, was actually one that engaged people in, in a number of sectors. So uh, we need the spaces and the time to do that. Uh, when it comes to actual campaign work and political work, I, I would say <laughs> my experience is it needs to be more focused. Um, you know, we, you know, uh, I'm not, we don't need to start the childcare movement from scratch, but you know, when we first did the work around equal pay for work of equal value and create equal pay coalition because there wasn't anything, 
um, we knew that there was much more to it than pay equity legislation, uh, that remuneration was broader, uh, that there were a lot of things that needed to happen. Women needed to be able to move between different jobs better than they could. There were separate seniority lists, et cetera. We chose to focus, and I think um, that it's just kind of different pieces of the puzzle here. Yes, we need the conversations, and we need to share ideas, um, but I do think when it comes to actual political, small p political engagement, um, that we are, are better um, doing some work uh, that is more focused. Does it, ha uh, 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 let's continue this conversation, but I wanted to ask, does, uh, uh, for example, on personal support worker, uh, because of the pandemic, because of uh, the shortage, because of the, the focus that it has had, uh, and let's assume that it, the wages are raised, that there's some, you know, conscious decisions to actually improve the working conditions there. Does it have a leveraging impact yeah. uh, on other care workers uh, in, for example, in the child uh, care concept? Or does it or does it not? That's a real question. I think it should. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and to it's sort of, you know, I agree with what you were saying, Laura. I think it is an, um, it's not an either or, it's both and. We should be pushing on, um, you know, this conversation about care work and that care work is undervalued, certainly. But, you know, when it comes to the Canada Wide Early Learning and Child Care System, that's, that's the vehicle that we're dealing with right now, and it should have a workforce strategy and it should have salary scales for, um, for early child educators. So that, I think that um, has to be part of it. But yes, I think that, um, I think, Morna, you were saying that the, you know, the um, federal government's, the health care money that was just negotiated, there is money mm -hmm. for raising the wages of um, yep, personal yes. support workers, and it shows the federal government can do that if mm -hmm. they want to. Mm -hmm. um, whereas what we hear back in childcare all the time is, well, that's not really a role for thing. the, you know, it's mm -hmm. harder for us to do that when it comes to wages. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have to push back on that very firmly um, because it can, it can be done. Terry. Yeah, I, I was actually just going to um, comment briefly and, and say that I think it's important to um, leverage the resources because the conversations are very similar and the uh, because it is care work like uh, it is I mean there are obviously overlapping concerns um, and I think there are ways to have really good convergence um, and I also think that it's important to be to be specific and keep the conversations distinct um, you know if the goal is to gain traction and to um, be focused about it in order to, uh, to to increase exposure and get 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 moving like action. Um, so that's that's my thought on that. Can I go to our other question? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, okay. yes, please do. <laughs> so it's funny that you asked that because <laughs> when I was watching the the first um, segment this morning and listening to the speakers, I was like, ah, I didn't mention for profits, mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, <clears throat> I will say I did focus on, you know, putting that emphasis on uh, improving what the landscape for publicly funded care in Canada looks like. Mm -hmm. And um, I agree with the conversations this morning just about the end, uh, putting in, I don't know quite how to phrase it, but whether it's putting an end to um, grandfathering out the, the for profits because. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think it's obvious, um, but I think that the, the goal should be on what, like raising up uh, uh, care, care specifically with children, I believe is like a social good. And I think it's for humanity, it's for society, <laughs> yeah. and there's a particular way that we can slash should go about that. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think I need to quote studies or anything, like I think so much of the work is already there. It's just a matter of looking at it and believing it. So, Good. so there is an online comment, and then I'll get to, uh, uh, to Lorna here. So uh, the the question uh, is, uh, well, there should be no place for profit. Mm. Unfortunately, a nonprofit status is being used as a proxy for quality. It takes much more to deliver and maintain quality early le learning and care. So uh, reactions, comments, uh, so Martha react there. 
do you want a uh, response? Well, so you, do you, you need, yeah. you need the mic. Sorry, I should, that's it. That's it. It, it's often used as a proxy for quality, mm -hmm. partly because the res there's a lot of research on this. Uh, there's a, there's a, good, a lot of research on it. Auspice is linked to, to quality or indicators of quality and to actual measured quality in many studies in different countries. Mm -hmm. So it gets to be used, but it's not really a proxy for quality. There's like a whole discussion in the early childhood field that goes way beyond anything that we would even dream of having here about what is quality and what does it look like and how do you reconceptualize it and all that type of thing. It is linked, it's clearly an association between auspice and quality, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be used. It can be used as a as an indicator of quality, yeah. but it doesn't mean all for-profit childcare is therefore bad, and all non-profit childcare is good. If you put them on a continuum, most of them in Canada are, uh, cluster in the middle, mm -hmm. and on the ends, there's very rarely very good for-profit childcare, and there's there's much less very bad non-profit childcare. I guess maybe that's my mm -hmm. summary for whoever mm -hmm. wants to comment on it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a rest maybe? Uh, yeah, uh, Morna? Yes. Yeah. Morna. Uh, I actually had a question on okay. a different topic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to? I can sort of. I can respond to that or sort of add comments. Yeah. I think the other interesting way to think about it is the business model, right? Mm -hmm. The nonprofit or public business yeah. model is very different mm -hmm. than a for profit business model. And we've been talking about financialization, um, which the nonprofit business model and the public model for sure don't for or don't facilitate. I think that's the other. So maybe not proxy, but there's definitely conversations to be had around what the model is and what it allows and what it doesn't. And, yeah, and the, the incentives within each model that, exactly. that right. may be, have to be ma uh, managed and uh, create different types of risks. Yes. Um, first of all, I just want to say how much I appreciate your question. Whose children are we talking about? Um, I think it's really profound, something I'm taking back with me. And um, also just to note that unfortunately many times when childcare is discussed, nobody talks about the children. Yeah. <laughs> and that the <laughs> emphasis is yeah. you know, very much about, it's about, it's really about the economy, it's about increased labor participation, which of course it's all those things, but it fundamentally, centrally has to be about the kids. Um, I, I have a question that mostly I think to Laurel, and that is um, uh, you talked about unionization being important. One of the things that um, it's a very low, low unionized sector. So the question, and, and quite honestly, unions have not been that much not interested yeah. in, uh, in using childcare. And of course, even where uh, childcare staff are unionized, it's been extremely difficult for unions to negotiate real wage increases. And so the child care movement and others have been pushing for uh, higher minimum wage standards uh, or wage grids is now, is now the, the language that's being used. And these are starting to be developed. But one concern I have is that they are developed without any active participation of the workers and then the educators themselves. So governments are developing the wage grids, then f public funding is being attached to these wage grids, and so the providers essentially have to abide by mm -hmm. and impose this wage structure on staff or lose or, or, or you know either lose funding by not abiding or not getting funding to be able to go beyond the standards. What in your experience would be the best way right now of ensuring <laughs> that frontline staff have a say in setting their working conditions while at the same time the movement pushing for standards to be set by government? Like how do we, yeah. what do we do now to address the challenge? I, this may seem strange, but um, I, I actually, in some ways, see this as the same uh, dilemma uh, where I've been trying to help on the side with mm -hmm. some people around Amazon <laughs> or <laughs> um, it is it, it, it is such a revolving door because of the precariousness and the lousy working conditions and the low pay and benefits. Um, that it, 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 makes, uh, it makes it more difficult to organize with that constituency. 
makes it much, much more difficult. And uh, because people are not invested in it mm -hmm. as, as a career, as a long time, and I, I'm using career, not the capital C, but you know, just as, uh, as something they're going to do for part of their lives. Mm -hmm. And, and as I said earlier, even possibly retire from it. Uh, and uh, so uh, it does, it's, it's the right now part of your question is the, the hard part, because hopefully uh, if we can move the, the dial on some of these other matters, you know, five, ten years down the road, that will be a different situation. And people better able to, uh, to organize and make those kinds of commitments. Uh, and to elect their representatives and all the things that go into it. Um, so in the interim, <laughs> um, I, I do think there is a place for, um, I, I, would, I would say that this might be one of the things that we should be thinking about. I mean, Constance posed the question, and, and too at the beginning, how do we organize in, in the current situation? And we do not have to start from scratch, but we, we should be thinking about some, whether it's a, a working group or something, um, the, uh, the uh, community auxiliary, <laughs> whatever we call it, um, to the, 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 uh, the child care community as it exists. I should be thinking about ways that we can really push forward these ideas of, um, in the interim, uh, a, a policy uh, table, um, and I say that that needs to happen at the federal as well as the provincial level, and there has to be that communication uh, and uh, collecting the data, sharing lessons, um, best practices, all those uh, things. Um, and, and maybe we could play collectively some kind of role in, in supporting that to happen, and that to me is the place, or a place, where some of the workers' voices uh, might be brought forward, um, because they're not there now. It, uh, that, that is one of the, um, the great difficulties we have now, uh, is that there is no mandated uh, voice, and I think we need to look for spaces mm -hmm. where we can have those mandated voices. Uh, and uh, not as a substitute for unions, um, but you know, as as part and parcel of uh, improving working conditions, at least in the interim. Yeah, I was just going to yes. add on to that. Um, so here in Ontario, and we are the recalcitrant province on on uh, Seawilk. Um, we even have a, a salary scale in the works from the provincial government, but I have the same share the same concerns that you mentioned, Morna, that those provinces where it's being developed, it's de being developed without workers at the table, without their voices. Um, and so here in Ontario, um, the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care, working with uh, MPP Batilla Carpoche, um, which is a private member's bill on this, saying that there should be a workforce strategy, it should be, there should be a child care workforce commission that guides that work. Mm -hmm. And the development of a salary scale should be developed through that commission that would have child care workers at the table, would have their associations and unions that represent them at the table to inform that work because that's the way that it, <laughs> it should happen um, as well as working in the community for you know, greater uh, unionization across the sector. And I think we yeah, have I ahead. just want to add oh. that you know I, I, I would throw into this mix um, the experience like the, the whole business of fed, yeah. uh, fed provincial yeah. territorial agreements um, they, they look and behave very differently yeah. than, than they did um, prior to the you yeah. know the yeah. Canada <laughs> Assistance Act etc yeah. etc et a while ago and um, uh, my direct experience was with the, the labor market agreements mm -hmm. and um, for all of the talk of mm -hmm. gathering information mm -hmm. and, and policing and so on, it, it, it doesn't happen. And even mm. commitments that provinces made to consult uh, with unions and other affected mm -hmm. uh, organizations representing uh, uh, labor, um, you know, so they had a meeting once a year for an hour and uh, that ticked off that mm -hmm. box uh, in their reporting back to the federal government. And one of the things mm -hmm. that uh, I, I remain, and I'm not alone, um, worried about uh, with the uh, current 
round of agreements, like in healthcare. Yeah. The, the federal government is saying that, you know, that the provinces have to uh, be accountable mm -hmm. and transparent, et cetera, and they have to report back to the public. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, In what no, format? Uh, <laughs> so, so does that mean that the federal government is not playing any role any longer, mm -hmm. uh, at even nominally in policing? Yeah. So I think these are all, these are the kinds of issues that we need uh, people to bring forward and certainly in the care economy mm -hmm. because uh, it's so critical uh, mm -hmm. to all of us. So I have, uh, yes, I, I want, I want to, I'm glad that you're here because I was getting, I was looking for you since, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought you might want to comment on the voice mm. of the workers. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm. uh, thank you. Yeah, so I wanted to tell uh, uh, everyone a little bit more about the Association of Early Childhood Educators. So we are the professional association for ECEs in the province. We've been around since 1950. Uh, we're both a member-based organization and then also a group that does at the end. Um, professional learning on a much larger scale than just our member base. Um, you know, in today's conversations, we've been talking a lot about, as Carolyn uh, mentioned, about the relationships that children have with their educators. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the relationships are central to the experience of childcare uh, for children. Um, I would also say that the experience of relationships and the meaningfulness of relationships mm -hmm. has to be core with educators mm -hmm. and for educators to feel connected to this work as mm -hmm. well and connected to this movement and the child care movement has not always been a movement mm -hmm. that has included all child care workers. Mm -hmm. um, here in Ontario we do this through something we call our decent work communities of practice. These are local groups that are all across the uh, province that are meeting up <coughs> and sharing. They do advocacy, local advocacy, they're made up of ECEs uh, and child care workers and then that is a way that we as represent the workers through these groups um, just kind of on the kind of consultation side of things I think this is so important because those relationships were not something that we built overnight that's taken five years it's continual trust and there's a lot of trust that has been broken between child care workers and the child care movement mm -hmm. because we haven't had that long-standing relationship mm -hmm. and relationships take time so I think that's where the work has to start as well if we want to have this kind of consultation and inclusion of workers, we need to be reaching out and having those relationships with workers and meeting them where they're at, having meetings, having mm -hmm. events that are accessible to them. Um, and I just want to have a kind of a quick example on this. We had uh, consultations on the workforce that the Ministry of Education um, mm -hmm. had yeah. in January. Uh, there was very limited consultations. There were private consultations. Um, we got the con questions a week in advance and alongside with the coalition, uh, we put out those questions as a survey to our members. Mm -hmm. We got hundreds of responses within a day or two. Okay. Educators are so eager to be consulted on this, they know exactly what they need. Um, and they are just banging on the door. Every time we put out anything like this, mm -hmm. we get so many responses. So they're eager to share their knowledge, mm -hmm. but um, there needs to be a place and a forum mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, actually, that's a good point even for today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Uh, Lorna, you had a question. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you. That was a very, um, it was superb leaded. We, we have this discussion in the context of all the problems of Canadian federalism. Mm -hmm. and, and one that I think you're raising is the interprovincial barriers for workers. Mm -hmm. You know, it took until 10 years ago mm -hmm. for insurance adjusters <laughs> to be able to work across a provincial line. Of yeah. all the absurdities of this country, that is surely a good example. So when you're talking about the work that you're doing, are you also trying to build federal standards so that a child care worker can move across a provincial boundary and be able to work? <laughs> good. And then I want sure, to get back to Terry in there. <laughs> yeah, so I was just going to quickly say um, the way it works now, every province does have quite different standards, um, mm -hmm. but there is equivalencies that can happen. Of course, it's not the easiest, as you're imagining. Um, I think as a kind of a movement or a strategy level, that's not something that's been a priority because um, we know that retention and recruitment are challenges across um, all options and that that is kind of the number one issue that we have to be facing. I think um, I think it can, it can, I'm worried it might be a distraction coming up, but I also want to say that 
there is uh, a real issue when wages are, may start to change very drastically between different places, yeah. which hasn't been the case. So right now, uh, in I think it's Yukon, EC wages are $30 an hour. Of course, wow. the cost of living is higher. Mm -hmm. But when I say that in Eastman's in Ontario, I get EC saying, I'm going to move to Yukon. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't the case before. Yeah. Yeah. So as we're starting to see these federal differences even heightening uh, with the different salary scales and the different processes, um, I think that's going to become an issue. But again, I think that there is some equivalency standards already in place. Um, and you know, the qualifications do vary. But there is some standards. I actually would say that here in Ontario, we have one of the simplest systems. We have an REC two-year, mm -hmm. or we have a non-RECE. Um, we don't want to be getting into too many levels right now. Um, other provinces have much more complex systems. Mm -hmm. So I want to. Uh, we're getting to the end of our of our morning. Very rich morning. Very informative. I think we're going to uh, uh, want to hear from you. Um, in several ways, I think we will share a reading list. Uh, we will share all, uh, possibilities for follow-up work that uh, may uh, be needed. But I wanted to offer to my uh, panelists here the chance to uh, offer concluding remarks uh, about um, what they w what would they like to see in the next as as we de develop an agenda for the next uh, year or two years. Uh, let's start with you, Carolyn. Oh, well, thanks. thank you for inviting me to, to come and join the, the panelists up here. And thank you um, for putting on this um, event today, because I think that this is part of the, the work that we have to do mm -hmm. as a movement. Um, I was chatting at the coffee break with some folks about the fact that, you know, we've, the Canada-wide child care mm -hmm. agreement has switched things for the child care movement mm -hmm. in ways that we're still contending with. Um, you know, for decades, the childcare movement had a vision of a system that we wanted. Mm -hmm. And as Martha said, we found new ways, more detailed ways to describe what it was, mm -hmm. new arguments to describe what it was. But that was, we wanted a national, we wanted the federal government engaged, we wanted a national plan. Now, we're in a situation where this strategy, this plan is rolling out and we're having to contend with new and sometimes mm -hmm. unexpected yeah. issues of implementation. And so we're having to be able to pivot, to switch gears, to contend with new questions that we haven't talked about together before. So I think that more for our like this to, to contend with those kinds of issues is really important. Um, but at the same time, to get back to what we talked about at the beginning, a public campaign. Mm -hmm. We need to be bringing more people in. We need to be organizing, I think, especially amongst parents, the parents that are currently excluded mm -hmm. from the system, right? Parents that have a childcare space right now, you know, they've just won you know, the lottery, <laughs> right? The bingo. They, they get half um, the childcare fees they were paying before. But so many families are excluded from that. So we have to find a way to engage them mm -hmm. in a public campaign. Um, to bring this uh, forward. And as uh, you know, Rachel was saying so um, eloquently, engaging early childhood educators and building that trust because many of them do feel, again, that the care movement you know, was happy to get lower fees for families and, uh, and, and didn't put their needs um, at the core. And so we have to build that trust back up and, and make a campaign for them. Important. Yeah. Um, just to to add on to that, I think uh, engagement mm -hmm. is key. I think uh, engaging, as I mentioned, with parents, engaging with the actual ECE, uh, engaging um, with experts who've, doing, who've been doing research uh, in this field for decades. Um, I think that's incredibly important. Um, developing frameworks that work is important. Um, I. I'm also mindful, I'm coming back to the question that you'd asked um, earlier, uh, just about for profits. I'm not kidding myself that there won't be some sort of mm. for profit model mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. um, I even think about some options that I've considered, you know, for my own child um, that are for profit, um, whether it's private school, whether, like there's, there's mm. ways that you can, there's ways that they can continue to exist, I'll say. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that fundamentally have to decide that child care is an important issue. Mm -hmm. And there's been um, floundering on it. And I, I think that the, 
you know, from, from the movement, there obviously would have to be thrust and momentum. Um, but at the same time, they're also on the other side, if we're talking about politically, there needs to be that, uh, that uh, uh, continuance as well and um, vocal support as well because it can't just all be one-sided. So that's the idea. Thank you. Laura. Yeah, um, I think... Thank, I want to say thank you, Reverend. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The Reverend. Reverend. <laughs> um, so uh, I just want to throw one additional uh, idea into the hopper, um, and that would be uh, to think of whether we can... Uh, it'll take money <laughs> just, and everything, but um, is there a way that we could have a forum at some point that would um, bring together either by Zoom or preferably in, in person, um, uh, ha have a forum where we would be talking to uh, people who are familiar with the systems in a couple of, uh, let, let's start Other within countries. Canada. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously we could do something international, but mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think it's really, uh, I mean, Quebec was ahead of the game uh, on this, uh, it is not, as those who have studied it uh, know, uh, a, a perfect system and it looks very different whether you're in the uh, Ottawa and Montreal area and if you are in rural Quebec, it's a very different situation. Um, but there are some things and it w I would think even help us raise the bar a bit because uh, I, I don't know the, the exact details but I know that a few years ago when, when I was talking to uh, uh, a woman in Quebec about her experiences uh, in living there and, and uh, 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 getting uh, childcare, she said one of the things that rarely gets mentioned but is so important is the seamless piece of this yeah. where your child mm -hmm. enters into uh, public school yeah. uh, and th I think to age 12 or some, mm -hmm. maybe you could correct me on this Martha, but um, you know to, to that age if, if you need after school care, not maybe on a regular basis, just because suddenly something's come up, uh, uh, you know, that that system is there uh, for you. Now, again, I will stress that this is Not predominantly this. Montreal that we're mm -hmm. talking about, but uh, so I, but we actually, I think, could be raising the bar a bit mm -hmm. about what is the, 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 expectations. the, the expectations of what we're building here. And I understand, I was talking in the, um, uh, with Morna and others about, uh, you know, I was saying, what happened to, you know, well, we're going to get junior kindergarten and then we're going to, we're going to keep working it back mm -hmm. down and stuff. And I understand it's, it's more complicated than that. But that always was, for me, a kind of vision uh, that kept uh, my thinking going was that uh, gradually we would work down. Um, you can't do it all at once, um, but we would, we would have that kind of integration, uh, even if it is some kind of, uh, um, there would be a pathway, <laughs> uh, even if it isn't exactly the same system. So anyway, there's all kinds of ideas. I just think it would help us to hear and share what is going on and, and, and indeed to raise the bar in thinking um, and expectation people who are doing the work often in their own province, Sorry. if not in their own municipality uh, here in Ontario. A good idea. So that's an ambitious forum uh, <laughs> uh, uh, across the, the country and probably we, we could benefit from some international expertise here as well to mm -hmm. uh, broaden our thinking, I would think. Uh, so before we uh, close, I want to obviously thank all of our speakers for agreeing to be here. I want to uh, thank as well uh, Constance and Lorna for uh, raising the issue and mm -hmm. wanting it to happen during our International Women's uh, Month at Massey College. Uh, you're invited if you want. We have there's there's a, a cafeteria upstairs if you want to eat at the Massey College and feel free to circulate around the college and and uh, look at it. It's uh, nice even under the snow, <laughs> so uh, you always are welcome uh, to if you you know for follow up issues or other ideas that you may have. 
constantly. I, I will mention a couple of things that are happening at Massey that you might be interested. Uh, we're having, on, on May 15th, we're having a book launch of a book by Mary Kay O'Neill, Mothering Alone, and it is mm -hmm. about, uh, uh, you know, uh, single mothers. Uh, so I'm sure that the issue of childcare will mm -hmm. come up. We had uh, just uh, Monday night, our book club was about a, fa a fascinating book that's called Some of My Best Friends, an essay on lip service by uh, Taja Isen, who is, mm -hmm. uh, was a, a, um, an alumni from, from Massey. So I encourage you to uh, reach out. And then we have movie night as well, mm -hmm. which is Category Women, who is a documentary of uh, uh, women from the South uh, who had to, uh, athletes, women from the South, who were forced to have all sorts of uh, surgical uh, changes just to be able to compete. Mm -hmm. So there's an uh, intersection of racism and mm -hmm. uh, sexism uh, being deployed, and that's on March 22nd. So you're always welcome at Massey, and mm -hmm. I just want to thank you again. I, as I said, I think circulate a, a reading list and possibly a bit of a mm -hmm. survey on what are the things, what some of the ideas that you have in terms of what we could do next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.